I'm Justin Elliott. Um, you've seen me probably too much by now. Uh, conference co-chair, software developer, IT manager. Um, system imaging I've been doing for a few years, so since System 7. Anybody use RAM disk on System 7? Yeah, right? It was pretty cool, wasn't it? I thought it was pretty sweet. And then Revar Dist for system administration. All right. Yep. Yeah, right. So, yeah. I never had to use at ease, thank God. I feel sorry for the people who had to, but and there was a product called Mac Prefect that was really good. Do you remember a simulator? Yes, I do. Yep. Peter. What was last Peter's last name? Lewis. Lewis. Thanks. Yep. What's that? Obi Wan. Obi Wan. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Really, back in the days. And then we all got tired of OS 9 and we were like, come on, Copeland. Oh. <laughs> and then it was Rhapsody. Yay, Unix? What? Okay, so took off. So that's great. So it's a good combination. Anyway. What's that? Pink? Yeah, yep, yep. That's right, I have a pink t shirt actually. It's in my closet. I forgot. It's a pink Pather on it too. At any rate, thank you for attending today. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about Blastrooms Config. This is not talking about netbooting. This is just about another deployment system imaging. Uh, the deployment tool doesn't do the imaging. Disk Utility is great for that. This is actually talking about a utility that restores system disk images to machines, as well as configuring the firmware security and running in pre and post flight restore scripts. And I'll show some a lot of uh, things about it using with, with workflows. This is a completely new version, 3.0. So for those who have used the previous version, I'll be asking. Uh, I'm interested in. Uh, definitely speaking up and who's ever tested. I know Yadin, you may or may not have had a chance to test it. Okay, that's, that's fine if you haven't. It's been out a short time, so that's all right. So uh, the format is basically though we've had some feedback as I mentioned in my other session. People have requested that in order to get through all the contents, uh, the slides, I have 40 slides. I've got some demo time here too. Please demo gods, work with me. Um, if, you have, if you need any clarification on any of the slides, please definitely speak up because uh, I want to make sure that something's not clear if I misuse a word or something or if there's jargon that I'm using that doesn't make any sense. Um, but if you have more in-depth questions, let's try to hold those off to the end because there are slides that may answer your questions. If they don't, then we'll, talk, we'll definitely talk about it at the end. And then if uh, I um, delay too much or get on tangents and there's not enough time for q and I'll be glad to talk after the session is over too. And so, but I don't want to tie people up for the next session either. Obviously. So, all right. So, who's new to Mac systems imaging and deployment? It's okay to raise your hand. I won't poke fun at you, I promise. Okay? Okay, great. That's fine. That's, that's great. You're in a perfect place for it. Uh, who has used Blast Image Config before? Okay, great. Who's glad that I dropped the PSU off of it because it was too hard to say with PSU on the front of PSU last time match config. So I dropped, I dropped that version of that in um, version 3.0. So you'll see that in the disk image and things like that. It's, I'm still working at Penn State. It's still developed at Penn State, but it's remove that. It's just easier to say. Uh, all right. Great. Thanks. So for the overview, and I hope the slides are showing. If I switch on the switcher and I forget to switch this, say <coughs> switcher, and I'll switch it because I did that this morning a couple of times. So. Um, so why was it developed? Well, in 2003, there was no uh, utility that did uh, everything that we needed to do for OS 10 deployments. That's right around the time of 10.2.2 that 10.2.2 came out. And for people who saw this presentation last year, it is completely different after this slide, I promise. This was the one that I used last year. Um, but, we still, but it's still needed today, heavily today. And a lot of people say, well, then why, why are you just still developing this? Why don't you just have everybody use uh, the Deploy Studio? Well, I actually considered that multiple times. I thought, well, should I take the time to rewrite it and, and add some new features? And the, the, the answer is yes. It's, the Deploy Studio is a great solution. Last image config, I think, is another great solution. They both, they both have their pros and cons. Um, and I think last image config uh, is easier to use. It's easier to get up and running. Doesn't require a server. Plus, a Deploy Studio has more power in some cases. It has more GUI-ness to it. They can both do the exact same things, but you can um, pick and choose. I do think Blast Image Config hand <coughs> handles management of firmware passwords a lot better than Deploy Studio, and we'll get to that. So there are advantages of both. Use them. I make no money. I just like developing it. It's also going to be very critical um, for some internal Penn State projects. So um, the Deploy Studio folks are not going to add for us. Uh, it's going to be a customized panel that I may make available to the public to, uh, for others if they want it. But we have some new projects coming on board that has very specific Macintosh needs for entering 80 
OU groups and a whole bunch of other specific information for one of our projects. So it'll have that as a feature for us. So I developed for Penn State, and then uh, it just is open as freeware. So it's always been free. It'll continue to be free. Um, I'm going to breeze through this because I think you'd rather see more about it than the background. But uh, first developed in 2003, we used it to, to do the initial imaging of our 700 plus Max. This is just laying down the image. Thereafter, we maintain and throw software updates to the machines automatically using a combination of RadMine, our admin D, University of Michigan. And then we also use another product by a big, uh, well, it's called, it used to be called Big Fix. It was purchased by IBM. They didn't like the name either. So they changed it to something more complicated and clinical sounding, Tivoli Endpoint Manager. So it's like, okay, great, that sounds exciting. Just like, you know, calendar and backups, that's kind of boring too, right? But, so they bought that, and so we use a combination of those two to do updates to that. So, and I mentioned that. Yep, so many system admins and industry, okay. Yep, sounds like I'm bragging, I'm not. I'm just happy that people are using it. Um, so the goals were obviously easy, easy, to, uh, easy to learn and deploy. It's supposed to be very low. You can run it from a FireWire disk or a flash drive. You can throw it on a NetBoot server. Uh, and so you can run it in, in a lot of different environments. Um, the goal also, it's not listed on here, but the real goal of Last Minute Config is that in where, where I work in classroom and lab computing, there's another group that I'm very lucky. They actually do the building, of the, the building of the computers in the labs. They take them there. They use our tools. And it needs to be really easy for them to use. They're not system admins like us, right? But it doesn't mean that it can't be used for system admins because you can do a lot of things with it. There's no way that they could, and it's, they're smart. It's just that not their, not their job to write scripts and system imaging and all that stuff. So Blast Image Config makes it super easy for them to boot up a machine, run Blast Image Config, and they say, pick this workflow, and they don't have to enter in anything else, and it just goes. I added, I think Yadin was asking for this, and the University of Utah uses this as well, some new features that it stores, does some cool things with the passwords now that you don't have to enter in the admin password, and I'll get to that. You may have seen the docs already on that, so. Um, no service required, very portable. It can use NetBoot. It's a great solution for a NetBoot environment. And streamlined automation. So that's been there for a while. But, yep. And then, yep. The intended users, people asking me this, so I threw this in here. Mac system admins, like us. I use it all the time, actually, for my own machines. And, um, and I've erased many hard drives of my own by accident. But there's, <laughs> it's like, oh, that's not good. Because it's running ASR. It's a front end for ASR, just like Deploy Studio uses ASR. So does BIC. There's no secret there. The run log. When it's running, I have a very verbose log. Feel free to look at it. There's nothing being hidden there. Um, it's, it's, it's wide open. Uh, computer lab admins, though, is what I was talking about. Field techs, IT staff, so it can be so any level that you want to use that. You can customize it for those folks. Computer, uh, so, and I'm throwing these in because people wanted to know how it's really used. Before, I didn't have slides about this. So I just jumped into the, the tech stuff. But um, so when is it useful? Um, yeah, when you have a new machine and you have your, your company Golden Master image, you want to throw it on. Uh, yeah, instead of DMG base images, you can just take an, a, an ASR ready disk image and throw it into the restore images folder or restore over ASR multicast or over HTTP. Everything that ASR supports, BIC is going to support that because it inherits and calls ASR. Um, and also when you're retiring Max or you're surplusing them, whatever you want to call it, whenever you're like, you know, G5s, bye bye. Um, it's great for that environment too because you can do a secure erase of the hard drive and also secure erase, uh, sorry, I'm out of order, but you can read, I know. It, it basically, it makes the machine ready. Erase all firmware, zero out the disk, and then it's ready to go. So, um, and it's a zero level, and I emailed the Mac Enterprise list a while back saying, you know, what do really people, now that hard drives, the tolerances on hard drives are really, really tight. Years ago, there might have been a way on older hard drives. Even if you zeroed it out, you could still get data off of it. And on this one guy sent me a fantastic article. He was actually from the NSA, which was interesting. He emailed me directly and he said, excellent question. Long story short, newer hard drives. And even Disk Warrior, and I emailed ProSoft Engineering makes what? Did they make? Data Rescue. Data Yes, that's it, Data Rescue, thank you. I emailed them and I was acting like a, a dumb customer saying, hey, if I zeroed out my drive, can I get data back with your utility? They're like, no. I'm like, good. So that's what we do with our labs. And so that was good enough for us. Uh, and I can add new features, too, as people ask for them. And I have done that, too. And so system requirements, version 3.0, 
requires 10.6 and any Intel Mac. If you want to use an older, if you want to do support for G5 or PowerPC based Macs, use BIC version 2.9. I'll keep it on the site available for download. It's the last universal version uh, running on both PowerPC and Intel. 3.0 is now just Intel. Uh, you need a system disk image that I have documented heavily and they're all over the place of how to use disk utility, including documentation on our CLC website of how to image the recovery HD partition. Turns out it's pretty easy to do. You have to go in the terminal and enable a preference setting, the defaults right command. That's all you have to do. Then launch disk utility and you can see all the hidden partitions and then you can image it from that point. It's pretty easy to do. I can show you the docs later if you want to see that too. Um, and you need a bootable OS 10 volume, the thing you're going to image that you're going to make from disk utility. And a Mac, of course, to restore it to. So it seems pretty straightforward. So getting started. So the install, um, I should and you can download it from CLC, itspsu.edu slash eu slash bic. Oh, sorry. Fix the microphone. And from there, here we go. Uh, it's, just, just, it's just a disk image. And I had pro if anybody noticed and downloaded and said, where's the backdrop? I've had problems with it behaving correctly. Um, so right now there's no disk image, uh, there's no background on the disk image and the window looks like that. And you'll drag and drop it to applications. So last image config folder, drag the applications, boom, drop it there. You can put it wherever you want. It doesn't have to go to applications. But. And there's also the readme file, the readme first. I would suggest reading that first. It's, it could be helpful. You can scan it over. If you're used to imaging Macs, You'll be like, yeah, okay, okay, got it, got it. But if you're new to Max Imaging, I would heavily recommend reading that, um, that readme file. So that's how you install. Once you're inside the folder, inside of the Blast Image Config folder, uh, there's a folder called Restore Images. This is where you would put your disk images you, you have created with either Instant DMG, Disk Utility, or other utilities that create system disk images. Um, and that tiny URL slash BIC disk images it will send you to the documentation of how to image disks for recovery HD and all that. And then you can use that documentation and use it in other locations too. And then you copy this to restore images folder. Again, that's on the local firewall drive. If you, it, you can still provide it though, URLs for HTTP based images and ASR multicast. You can do that as well. So, and these slides will be available on our webs, on the Mac admins website sure, very soon. So if there are URLs, I can give it to you later as well. Okay, so I'm going to do a basic run demo, which is going to show booting from a FireWire drive. It has OS 10 Lion, BIC version 3.0, Alpha 2. It's actually beta now. I've just not changed it. It's beta quality, and um, as people have used 2.9, they've seen betas for a long time. It's actually been very stable. So I need it because if it doesn't work on 700 machines, I'm in trouble. So it's been working great on testing, and I've been testing it for many months. So. It's easy to set up, no servers required, and does fast restores. So I will jump over to the client. And so this is a machine that's been booted already with FireWire hard drive. This guy, or gal, I can't tell, I didn't name it, so I don't really have a, what's that? Yes? Got any FireWire? Nope, you can boot off of USB or USB flash drive, Roy? USB 3.0 drives do not like slow them. Just fine if you're picking a line image. Okay. Snow Leopard drives. Snow Leopard on a USB 3.0 drive with a USB 2.0 connector with a balance. Really? Okay, that's good to know. Excellent. That's good. That's useful. <coughs> What's that? I'm handing out mic for questions. I oh. We can't hear him. Oh, okay. Sure. We're looking for a microphone. I don't know if there's one. Maybe it was taken. It's just one. It's just wired. Never mind. That's a little too difficult. Okay. I can try to repeat the questions. If you would. Okay, all right, cool. Roy was asking about, or mentioned booting with USB 3.0 flash drives not working on 10.6. 10.6, okay, great. And there was another question. <coughs> okay. To boot from, okay. All righty. Okay, so this machine has been booted with the BIC FireWire HD. It's kind of old school now, now that we have SSDs. You know, it's just a volume. But I just call it that because it was easier for me to identify. So uh, we'll do a basic walkthrough. So this is already installed, obviously. I've got a restore image already in this in the restore images folder. There's some documentation, but here's the fall 2012 HD disk image. It's been saved as a read-only compressed image and scanned. Um, you want to scan it. 
because, and it's in the documentation that explains it why, but whenever you create disk images, it's, um, Apple now requires it to be scanned using disk utility to restore it. It actually optimizes the restore, the layout of the disk image uh, data, and your restore times, if you don't scan an image, will be considerably slower. We ran into this because Rusty and I, we were testing, and um, we used Bison Image Config Labs a lot, and he had created an image, and um, it, what the image wasn't scanned, and the restore took four hours when it should have taken 20 or 40 minutes, and I thought, oh God, something's really broken. And it turns out the image wasn't scanned and reordered, so it makes that much of a difference. So make sure you scan your images. It's in the documentation on how to do it. It's very simple. Uh, you can actually do it with command line with ASR, image scan, and you can spot the path to the image. It's pretty fast. If you use nice command, you can make it running a little bit quicker too. Uh, all right. That's usually disk I.O. bounce. If you can put it on a RAID, it might go faster. Then I also image the Lion Recovery HD as another image as well. It's pretty small, but it's, a pretty, uh, it's essential, and you can use that later in a post-restore script to partition the disk, throw on the main partition. The post-restore script will then restore that image, and you're good to go for a full Lion image installation. All right. In the network images list, that's also a text file that they're commented out right now. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, come on, scroll. There we go. Come on. These are both commented out, but uh, ASR multicast server and also HTTP my web server edu and the master image.dmg. So if you comment those out, those would be available to BIC in the restore image dialog, which I'll show here in just a moment. All right. And okay. So we'll go back to Blast image config, and I will launch that. Okay, so you'll be presented with different workflows. Workflows are very easy to set up, and I'll talk about those, but I'm just doing a basic demo uh, run right now, and we'll cover workflows, so this is the overall. This is me, manual, obviously, running it in a manual mode. Once you do a workflow, if you have automatic, if you have auto run enabled, it will fly, but goes through all the screens and just sets some defaults, so that folks like in classroom like computing, they don't have to worry about clicking, oh, I want this, I want this, I want this. It's, I know, we know what they want to, should be using for the lab, so I'll say next. Okay, so now this is, setting, uh, this is the setting up the firmware security. And at this point, you can do command, recommended, or off, or full. Uh, using the administrator password of the, of the FireWire drive. And I'm going to explain a little bit about this because this sometimes is confusing. Uh, the, so because our lab machines are being built by folks who should not have administrative rights on, in our particular environment, yours may be different, of course. In our lab environment, they don't have admin rights to the system once it's been installed, right? Only we have that. But they need to still boot the machine that has firmware security enabled. So in our lab environment, I have it set that they, when, they use, uh, when they build the machines, the firmware password is exactly the same password as if, uh, for the admin account used with the FireWire disk they're booting with. Does that make sense? I can say it again. So that, that way, they only need to know one password. Firmware password matches the main account they're booting with the FireWire drive. Firmware uh, on Macs uh, is similar to BIOS. You can restrict what volumes a Mac can boot with by enabling firmware security. And when you boot it, you can be prompted for password to prevent students from booting from their own devices. So I will leave that on command and I'll say apply. And it's successfully updated that. So now the next time it boots, if I hold down the option key, it's going to ask for the default password. I did get ahead of myself. Let me back up. Sorry about that. It's a new feature in BIC that I, I'll explain what I'm doing here. So it's, BIC is like any other admin utility. When it runs, it needs to have administrative rights, sudo rights. Deploy Studio, when it makes a netboot image, it's running as the root user, right? And it's actually, well, they've done some tricks to make it run so that it doesn't have to prompt for passwords. BIC in 3.0, I have it now asking to store the administrator password in the keychain. So when the user logs in, keychain unlocks, BIC reads to see if the, the admin password is there, checks to see if it still matches. If it does, it continues on and it's good to go. It doesn't have to prompt the user at all. Otherwise, it's going to be annoying to them. Um, and you're thinking, oh my god, the admin password stored in the keychain isn't that bad. No, because the FireWire drive asked me to log in. The keychain is not stored in the clear. It's encrypted. And they have to log in. So. That's, in our minds, we believe that's secure. It's not stored on the disk and clear at all. So here's the PSU Blast Image config key can, or a keychain item. I'm going to delete that. And now 
which I should have done previously. Apologies. Because this is the basic run demo. Now, it's, since it can't find that keychain item, it says, hey, I don't see a keychain item. What's the admit, local admin password? And hopefully I can remember what it is. I think I do. <laughs> um, and now it's stored it in the keychain. Now, the next time Bic runs, it will not ask for it because it's stored it. And now it has it. So it checks the keychain that it just created, matches it to the admin password, good to go. And now it's in. All right. And yeah, OK. That's me yelling at myself. So I have to select the workflow. Oh, I'll say run, apply. OK, it applies that. Now here I can select it. Yes. yes. Since you're not changing anything, you still have to apply that? You don't have to. But it's good to do it because, uh, because yeah, I did not have to change because I had already set that in the previous run. Correct. By quitting, it doesn't undo what you applied. But it doesn't hurt to apply it again because it's the same setting. Yeah, good question. The pre-restore scripts are available. You can do a mount server volume, uh, which is just a shell script in the pre-restore folder. They're all here. I'll run the basic one for now to disable the computer sleep and disk display. I'll run that. Very manual process, you can see. This is all automated with workflows. I'll show them next. So you, the pre-restore scripts, good things to run are things that tells the computer not to go to sleep. Mount servers, send in reports if you want to, say in the machine starting to image. Anything that you think you would want to do before imaging the disk. Mounting servers, all that kind of stuff. You can set the date. People say, why do we have this? Well, because there were issues in the labs with on boot up in the labs because we use Kerberos, you want your time to be within five minutes of the clock. And yes, you can set NTP to automatically set the clock when your machine boots up. But occasionally in the labs, we were seeing DNS resolution not working for a clock.pcu.edu, and the clock couldn't be resolved. If the clock was off a little bit, Kerberos people couldn't log in. So that's bad stuff. So they set it to their, their iPhone or their smartphone on them, which is pretty accurate, actually. And they move on. So if they need to update the time, they can. That's probably pretty accurate. OK, fine. I'll say, you know, it's for fun. I'll say 1.53. OK, date and time is updated. And the clock got updated immediately, and it's good to go. Next. This is where you can specify if you, well, how you want the network settings to be applied on the disk that's getting restored. I'm just going to select DHCP just to move on. But you could enter in static IP. It asks you all the different names or the IP addresses. Um, subnet mask. You can also specify DNS and other settings like that. All right. So after setting this, the specific network settings, uh, you'd say computer network names. You don't want to configure them. OK, fine, don't. Thanks for the bug report on this, Yaten. And you can move on. Or you can say configure as lab Mac. And then I can insert the serial number so it's a nice, unique number, right? And the, lower, the local bonjour name requires hyphens instead of spaces. So we'll say next. OK, now it's searching for local disks. And you'll see that the two FireWire drives are mounted. There are actually four vol volumes. The FireWire drive is partitioned into two, and the internal drive is partitioned into two. They're both empty, but I did it for the demonstration here. And so if I said, please select the disk image, I could say fall 20 to uh, 12. Which disk do I want? Select the one. Now, if you select create single partition on parent disk, oops. One second. If I, the, uh, there's information on the right-hand side telling you which disk it is. You can open up Disk Utility at this point and say, well, what's really going on here if I want to look around, see what partitions belong to what. So there's the internal drive. It's two different partitions, system and user. OK, great. So I added the create single partition on parent disk because for our labs and a lot of folks, they said, well, I want you to be able to repartition the entire drive, erasing the recovery HD volume, because in the labs, we don't want that. In your envi environment, you may want that. So you would uncheck that. Or you could still leave it checked, and in a post-restore script that is included with BIC, install the Recovery HD partition yourself. Yes, sir? You zoom in on that disk? Sure. I hope. I'll try. Come on. Uh, whoa. Yeah, this track trackpad's acting strange. Maybe I should lower the resolution. I can actually lower the resolution of the screen. Why don't I do that? Because uh, well, it should be OK. I'll try 8 by 6. Good question, though, because, yeah, I actually, are they both 8 by 6? Sure. 
Is that better? Is that going to be better? Okay. And the preference, yeah, the finder has fun doing this. Come on. Ah. I should love when it doesn't show the finder desktop stuff. It's nice. I think this has got to be a bug. Come on. Ideas. Yeah, I think I may have to. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, where is it? All right, fine. We're going to relaunch the finder so it'll redraw stuff. Hey. Everybody's like, oh my god. Yeah, I don't like it either. All right, we're going to say by kind so we can just see where stuff is at. All right, so anyway. Yep, <coughs> okay. So I'm not going to, we could wait, and I could do the restore. Uh, it would take probably two minutes. Um, create single partition and secure, but I think it might be a better demonstration if I show you the auto run of the whole process. I think I'll probably wait to do that because then I can show you the whole full run of the post restore process. Yeah. All right, I lied. We'll just do this. Okay. So it's going to repartition the disk based on that checkbox. So you're, you're blasting both partitions? It's creating, yes. Right now, because the create single partition on disk is selected, it's taking the parent disk of that volume system and erasing and creating one new partition. And it blows away everything. You can, actually, through a post-install post -install script, yes. I haven't added additional partitioning features yet. But the post-install script takes the drive that got restored and repartitions it to 650 megabytes, and then can restore the recovery HD volume and then add it there. Or, and, or you could restore other images, but I haven't added that feature just yet. So if you're talking like another data drive volume that you want to restore, you can do that for the post-restores. Yes, sir. Oh, how large is this one? I'll tell you in a minute once we uh, once it's done restoring. But it's probably three or four gigs compressed, I think. So it's probably around there. I think it's I named it that. It does. It's the standard line install. It's a compressed read-only disk image. So um, at this point, yeah, this is like watching paint dry. Um, what's that? Oh, yeah, that's true. But. It's pretty cool. So InstaDMG is great for spitting out a disk image where you would use it here under the disk to restore. So since we're, it's almost done, but the disk image, uh, of course, at the top, the pop-up, that's where we had the restore images folder. If we had on that network file specified URLs to the images, they would also show up in the pop-up menu. It's easy to show that, but disk to restore, you saw in disk utility what those were. Uh, create single partition, we talked about that. That'll erase all the disks on there. Um, there is a feature in Blaster Image Config that I enabled for myself and others. <laughs> it, um, let's say that you have multiple partitions in your machine and you really care about one partition and you don't want it to be erased because it's just in source code for something. Okay. Let's just say, for example, thank God for SVN. And uh, there's now, I, now BIC checks if you're selecting a volume that's on the same disk as another volume, if there's a file on the root of that drive, and this is documented, I promise, it's called, it's really a long name on purpose. Blast image config, ignore this volume. It will look for that and say, whoa, wait, there's a disk that has this flag on there. I'm not touching this disk. And I'm like, thank God. So I'm like, why don't I add this? Finally did. So now it's done. And I, I don't know if I saw the elapsed time, but it's in the log. It was pretty quick. You put that file in a particular partition, and it will ignore that partition, or? You do a touch on the base of the file. It's, um, so you'd open up the terminal. CD2 slash volumes, the name of the disk, and do a touch space dot blast image config. Ignore this volume, and it will ignore that, it will, and it will not appear in the disk to restore list. Okay. And it's, it's well documented, too. I can, I can show you that later. Secure erase before the restore. What that will do is it'll zero out the disk and then restore your image. Um, and then enable verification is slower, but that's part of ASR to restore the data and make sure it's written and matches what's in the disk image, too. So, All right, so we'll hit next. And I'm just going to hit next again. Like I said, a very manual process. Creates a new automatic network location. Sets up the computer name. It does DHCP. It went by pretty quick, but that's the option there. And here is an option, too, to say, I'm going to make the boot, the, the, I want to enable the boot blocks on the machine, on the hard drive that got restored. 
and then I also want to set it as a startup disk. That will change the firmware on the machine to boot up from the disk. Some people don't want to actually do that. I think Yadin, you and others requested that one time, where you'd want to restore an image to a bunch of drives, but you don't want to change the machine because you're imaging a bunch of firewire drives or you're doing target disk restore of a bunch of machines too and you just want to go boom, boom, boom. You don't have to, you don't want to change the machine to, to boot from that because it's another machine. So uh, next, setting the system disk. Great, here's the post install. There's a bunch of scripts included, partition restore, line recovery HD. I've got this hosted on GitHub as well. So if anybody wants to contribute there, that's great. It's, been, it's in Perl. I know it's an old language, but it works well. But it's hard to read. Perl in general. Oh well. And then also we have a post install packages script. This is something that Rusty Myers wrote and contributed to Blast Image Config. So it's an easy script to call. When it runs, it looks inside of a folder in the post restore folder. These are all located in the, come on. Hello. Post restore scripts folder and the blast terms config folder. And all of these that you see here are what, are what we are viewing in this other window behind it. You could add uh, PKGs in this and they'll all get installed by that particular script. In this case, I'm just going to show you what it does with um, print all arg variables. So there are a few that are sent to it from blast image config. Which drive, network setting, the disk, and the, the total bytes available on the disk that uh, some people wanted. And it's also useful for the post install of the recovery HD, the line hidden partition. And now you can either quit, restart, or shut down. And these are all graceful restarts and shut down. And so I'll just quit. So that's, that's a basic run demo. I know it's pretty boring. It's better to see when it's auto running because you're like, oh my god, just go. Because you'll get really tired of clicking through the manual process. But that was to illustrate what each stage does there. All right. Go back to the keynote. What time does this session end? 2.30? Does anybody know what time this is supposed to end? Is it 2.45? Okay, great. All right. I tend to talk fast, but I'm trying to get through the content to get to questions too. All right. Workflows. These used to be called, I don't know, I changed them a few times because it was confusing and then finally just got to workflows because that's what everybody kept asking me, why are you calling it config files when they're workflows? I'm like, yeah, they're workflows. So workflows are what you saw at the beginning. When, we first, when I first launched Blast Image Config, there were multiple options to select. They're very easy to create. There's a master workflows list uh, that you can select, lab, kiosk, secure erase, anything you want to call that makes sense to you or your users who are going to use it for their environment. And workflows determine the default settings that should be used, such as the firmware settings, default disk image, default pre and post restore scripts, if it should auto run or not. In most cases, you'll want to auto run, I, I, I suspect, because it drives me nuts if I have to do a manual install. Oh, come on. Why didn't we go? Okay. So inside of the Blast config work, there's a wic workflows.xml file in the workflows folder. And that is. Where we're talking about is this folder right there. So blast image config and then the workflows inside of there. There's a workflows document right here. If we open that up, you'll see that there are two different entries for the default preferences and the 1073 auto run restore. So it's just straight X XML. As long as you keep the tags together, you can put in hard returns so it makes it more readable. Otherwise, it's really one long line and that's like uh, a pain to read. Eventually, I'll make an editor for this, but it's an easy text file to edit at this point. Uh, and I'm adding more XML features as I get time between doing this and my job, my other job. So, and yep, everything, everything in the work from workflow to the end. You can just say display name, description, and the file name. The file name is going is what specifies what config to use. There's a folder in workflows that we will get to. Um, so the examples of use, we touched about on this a little bit. Uh, you could use the same base image, but customize critical settings. So let's say you have a baseline install, but you want to have it behave differently at login. You want to have additional post install scripts. Oh, this is for a faculty desktop versus um, front office desktop versus, or you know, you've got um, uh, administrative assistance. I mean, so you can still use a base OS and install additional customizations to it afterwards. Also retiring Macs, as we mentioned as well, racing hard drives and firmware security settings, things like that. 
All right, so now let's get down to where the workflow configs are. Inside the workflow, inside of the workflow, um, I'm ahead of myself, sorry. Okay, yeah, we've talked about this one. There are a lot of default workflow settings in the file. I know that's hard to read, so I'll bring it up on the, on the client machine and I'll make it larger because, yeah, it is tough to see text that far. And switching over. Inside this file, which is, uh, which is documented on the, the Blastermage config website, there are a bunch of key values. Here's the URL to the, uh, to the documentation. Anything with a pound sign in front of it's commented out. Anything else is not. So number of lo run logs to keep. Um, auto run, prompt to auto run, yes. Default auto run image. The things you'll probably care most about are firmware settings. They're pretty critical. Uh, here's where you can specify a pre-restore script and log the output from that script if you want. Some people want it, some people don't for security reasons. You may not want to dump whatever thing's being bumped out. It's up to you. Skip the date and time. Now here are your network settings. You can set it to DHCP or set it to set IP. So this file, as you can see, it looks pretty boring. Text, uh, it's, just, it's a straight text file. I want to move this to XML. Just ran out of time, but it's easy to edit. So that's the workflow file. There are 47 different settings available uh, that you can configure on that. And I keep adding more too as people ask for different things and then as things prop, uh, creep up that we need, we add those as well. So the workflow is demo. Yep, okay, so, all right. So, uh, yeah. Default, the default preference that is included with because uh, yes, everything's defaulted as commented out, um, and then you can enable them yourself. So, is this six, eight, nine, six? Okay. I'll try to make the font bigger. Please let me know if it's not big enough, and I will be glad to change the size. All right. So let's in the Blastermage config folder inside of workflows. There's the default install. It's really called workflows, but for the demo, I've renamed it. So here's what you'll see at a default install. Uh, yeah. I hope it's going to open. Okay, there we go. All right. This is the default installation. If I wanted to add an extra workflow, I would simply say copy this and then paste in something else, right? So I'll save that. Uh, or not save that, rather. I'll launch BIC. And I will change. I'm going to run, I'm going to run demo. I'm going to rename this to the default. And now when BIC runs, it will just see that one file. Reads that file, says workflows are available. Oh, I've seen this happen, that's weird. Come on. I think you renamed I think I did. Yeah, you're right, you're right, Mike. Uh, that's strange, sorry folks. Slow down, Justin. All right. Yeah, definitely catch me if I do something stupid, which I think I did. I didn't do anything, but all right, let's try that again. Well, I think I've got it in the dock. Yep, here we go. All right. Yay, okay, so now you'll see that there's only one entry. Okay, just showing this to show the linkage of what's going on here. So let's say I wanna add this auto run config file which I've already edited from the default that is included with BIC. Here's a default file. Everything is commented out except for number of logs to keep. That's just by safety factor, right? Because you don't, and that leaves it up to the person who downloads it to take the comment off the line and then they're manually acknowledging that they're enabling that. So I'm gonna add this that I've already configured, careful. And here's where I've got all the settings already set up by myself of what I want it to be. I need to copy the file name of the new config, open up workflows XML, paste that in there for now. And now I'm gonna duplicate this workflow. I could change it in place if I wanted to and only show one. Or I can make a new workflow and call this uh, MacAdmin's demo. Uh, Sure, Mac admins demo. Oh, this works. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fine. All right, so we'll just say Mac admins demo. I don't want to, you know, 
Macadamins demo, not that O, the other one. There we go. All right, so now there are two different workflows in there. And now, if I launch BIC, I'm sure you've already figured out what's going to happen. There are now two of them, Macadamins demo and Macadamins demo 2012. You can put extra information at the bottom that says, select this workflow to install the kiosk lab install or kiosk install for the hub, something to that effect. So. Um, so it's, it's, that's pretty straightforward, I think. I'm not going to bore you with going all through all of the details of the workflow settings. If we go line by line, I'm going to fall asleep. So I don't want to, I don't want to bore you all with all of the settings. Like I said, they're heavily documented. Um, and I'll be glad to ext extrapolate on any of those. And I, I respond to emails pretty quickly, too. So, so that's it for workflows demo. I know I'm rushing this, but I'm going to get to the auto button as well. Online documentation. Tiny URL slash BIC workflow man manual. All right. Any questions on the workflow with stuff? I know I'm pretty quick there. So workflow can contain any number of packages? It can, the workflow itself will specify what post install script to run. And that script runs all of the packages in a folder that it finds. So good question. So in that case, what I would do is, and Rusty and I have worked together on this one, and it works pretty well. In the workflow, get the name of the post install script. Where is it? Well, oh, something went nuts with the, I did, with uh, labels. <laughs> post install, post restore install. Uh, let's change that to icon. That's really, there we go. I can't even find it. There we go. That, that, and here's the readme for it. Post install read. So. This, tells in the, this is included in the blast image config download. There's a readme file in the post install. It'll tell you what to do here. So step one, you want to add it to the post restore script workflow. You'd specify the name of the script. And then you would make sure that the folder exists. And then place all your package installers in that folder. And it'll install them one by one. So in the workflows, I would say, oh, sorry, not there. I go to here. Mm. Which one is that? That's the other one demo. Okay, I'm just gonna do it so I don't change the so I don't destroy the auto run demo, but uh I'm gonna stop that. Is it smart enough to follow aliases for those packages in the I believe so. Yes, it should. So you can overlap it sets. I believe you can. Because I did that for disk images. I have aliases for disk images all the time in the restore images folder. Because I don't want to necessarily have them there. I want another drive. But just because it's easier to make an alias, should work. If not, a hard or a synthmix should work as well. Yeah, How about case. something like install a base image and then customize the user template so it doesn't have to that? If you can create the package installer to do that, yeah, you can call that an, as a post install script. Uh, the post install script would call a package installer that does exactly that. You'd have to make the package yourself. And that's the same exact package you would use with ARD, Deploy Studio, or anything else. All right, so I'm going to go back to the slides. OK, so firmware security is pretty important. And that's on work for us. OK, so firmware security is very important. Apple changed some things uh, recently. You want to definitely be aware of this. Um, it's f arguably for the better, depending on your slant. Uh, so yeah, Mac's built about uh, after mid 2011. Require. Sorry, I'm paranoid. I'm gonna make sure I've got the time. I think we said 2:45, right? Seems. <coughs> wow. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. Good. Yes. Okay. The new machines require that you know the old firmware password now before you change it to the new one. That's pretty big because if you forget the old firmware password in machines made after 2011, you will have to go into GSX or you'll have to call Apple to unlock it to provide a key for you, a temporary key that you'll have to enter at login. That would be a major pain in the butt if you have 700 plus lab max to, to manage, right? It wouldn't be a big deal, though, on the older machines that don't, that don't require that. And you can easily reset the firmware password by pulling RAM and zapping the PRAM for three times. And by doing that, it knows you have access to the inside of the machine. And that will erase the firmware password. But Apple will remove that ability because it turns out, and I had a discussion with somebody in email, uh, I didn't like this feature. 
security, but he said, well, think of it this way. I've got 12,000 students in K through 12, and they've read on the internet of how to do this. I'm like, oh, yeah. One screw off the keyboard, pull a RAM, zap, boom, they're in, they have admin rights, right? So I said, okay, that's a good point. So I made a new feature. Did you have a question? Correct. Yes. Good point. Yes. So the question was, uh, that requires a previous firmware password if one was enabled. That's correct. Yeah. If one is not enabled, then it's nothing. Then you can just enter in a new one. Good point. Yeah. Well, thanks for the clarification. Justin, what about yeah. your workflow or whatever to you know, prepare a machine for the salvage? Do you still need that firmware password to erase it? Yes, you do. Anytime you make a firmware password change to enable, you'll need the new password. The old one doesn't exist. You don't need the old one. Anytime you have a password existing, if you want to erase it, you have to know the old password before you can erase it. So, yes. But I have a really cool solution for it in BIC 3.0. Sure. The, uh, uh, on the newer machines, in order to uh, restore them, you have, to, you have to have the firmware patent. On the new machines from a factory? Yeah, no, no, no. So if you've got post mid-2011, uh -huh. the firmware has been set. Yes. You can't change. You can't restore that without the firmware. You can. You can restore it. The firmware password will prove as long as. Uh, yeah, I know what you're. Sorry, I know what you're asking. I'm trying to make sure I'm coherent when I say it. Um, and I did not have any beer over lunch. I promise. Um, if you can, yes, you can restore any hard drive on the active system of another volume as long as you have the sudo admin password. That's different than the machine's firmware password. So you can erase a machine or hard drive all you want without knowing the firmware password if you have admin rights. So if your lab machine, student sits down, they don't have admin rights, they, they don't know the firmware password, and they don't know the admin password for that machine. They can't erase their, the internal hard drive or another volume owned by that. So. The firmware, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. The firmware then just controls the ability of the machine to move from it to next terminal. A different volume, that's correct. Right. So let's say, yeah, if they had a flash drive and they had a Linux uh, Ubuntu or something in distro, which is actually pretty cool, you wouldn't want them to boot from that. They'd have to option boot and it would put up a password. They could not get through that. It would stop them from that. Yes? I was going to mention, I think, I'm trying to think if this is correct or not. Mm -hmm. On a newer Mac, say you forget the firmware password, as long as you have admin rights, I think you can still use the that, not anymore. That, that method, NVRAM and resetting, the, thank you for mentioning that. That was the other method that you could do. Okay. On older machines, you could, yeah, NVRAM and set change the security dash password to nothing and security dash mode to nothing. No longer works. And OFPW, uh, well, OFPW for Mac Enterprise that we got in some way. Uh, <laughs> Apple. Uh, F, turned into FWPW, I recompiled it for Intel. That no longer works. So, but thank you for asking. That was an excellent point. Um, uh oh, this is being recorded. Hmm. Yeah, it's so late now, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, okay, yep, I mentioned OFPW. Thanks for mentioning that. All right, so Apple Set Reg Prop Tool. This is a utility to set, does the heavy lifting of setting the firmware password, okay? This is the utility you'll find in the utilities on a Lion Recovery HD uh, hidden and also uh, on a Snow Leopard install system disk as well. They really don't make it easy to get to this utility. They, it comes with your install media. System admins are going to have access to it, but they, don't, but they don't want to make it downloadable from the net in case it encourages script kiddies to do more stuff with it. So, but this is the tool. Inside of it, though, you'll need to get the, um, the uh, set reg prop tool. It's a command line executable that actually changes, changes and manages the firmware security on the old machines and the new ones as well. And there's, I've got documentation on how to do this for Lime. I've included a Perl script that actually does it, and what it does is it mounts the install Lion application, and I'll do the demo here. And I have videos on this too, because I was in the video crazy mode for a while, not sure why. But uh, screen recording now on Lion and Snow Leopard's super easy. Anyway, it mounts a disk image, now it's another one, knows the exact path to get the system image, or rather set reg prop tool, and plops it into place. You need to do this. This has to be installed for Blast Image Config in order for it to do its job for firmware security. The folks who make Deploy Studio, we don't know who they are. We have suspicions. Everybody does. Uh, it's a great utility. They are including set retro prop tool with their binary. I think they're doing it until they get yelled at by Apple. 
I'd rather, I want to include it with, with Blast Image Config. I can't legally do it. If they didn't, if I could be like Deploy Studio and not have my name attached to it at all, then I would. But it's pretty obvious who's developing it, <laughs> so I can't. But I can give you a demo of how to install it, and it's super easy. So, and there's also a demo for 10.6 on the web, on the documentation. So I'll jump to the client. And, is that showing up? Okay, good. All right, so now in the Blast Image Config Resources folder, the SetRich Prop Tool folder. I'm going to delete it from here. Boy, this is gutsy. Okay. And now, here is the command line. You, here's the Perl script. You can read it if you want to. It's, I'm not going to go through line by line right now. That would bore people to death. So, the way you install it is very easy. You just go sudo the script. And then you look for the line installer. Under, in this case, it's slash applications. Right there. Go back to terminal. And you can drag and drop it. So it gives it the full path. And that's it. And then you sit back and be amazed. I'm going to leave that window open so we can see it plop in in the background. Now, let's move it over. You'll see, you'll see a bunch of disk images getting mounted and stuff. OK, demo gods, be nice. And now it's going to ask me for my local admin password. Oops. Uh, what is it? OK. And now it's mounting. It's going inside the, uh, it's happening really quickly, but I'll try to say. It's opening the install Mac OS 10 lion.app. There's an install ESD disk image, and there's yet another hidden disk image in there called base.image or base system, something like that. And then it mounts that. Then it knows the path on that disk image that's mounted of where it, uh, where it should get. And there's the second disk image mounted, and boom, it's got it. So it's mounting two disk images, one embedded inside of another, knows the full path to the Apple system image, uh, not system, sorry, that was this morning, security firmware password utility, copies the binary out and puts it into the folder. And now you'll see that it's now here. That's the file. I deleted the previous one and now it's recopied it back to that folder. So that's as easy as I could make it for now. I could put a GUI on it. I could make a GUI front end for it sometime, but I think, that, I think that's pretty easy to do. Yes, no? If not, I'll make a GUI eventually. Just a matter of time. So that's basically the install demo of that for Lion. 10.6 actually is a little bit easier. Uh, it's, not as, it's not as obfuscated, uh, the path. And um, I've got a demo video of how to do it for both OSs. So, so because, all right. Uh, OK, yep, <laughs> another demo. OK. Thanks for your patience on this one. Uh, all right. So in order to keep track of the old and new passwords, especially for our lab and classroom support, something you have to keep track of the old passwords in case, let's say, I give them a new FireWire disk. It has a new password on it. They boot up. They're going to need to know the old firmware passwords. They're going to know that, and they're going to know the new ones. But that's a lot of passwords to, for the OS to remember. Right? When Blast Image Config runs SetRich Prop Tool, it has to supply the old password. Well, if they boot up with the firmware, I'm sorry, if they boot up with the FireWire disk or over NetBoot, it's only going to know the current admin's password. So I made it an encrypted database that BIC reads from to see what the old passwords were. So you can keep adding them in there, and it will try them one at a time until it finds the one. So anytime you add it that you change the password, it always stores the previous admin password in that file. It's probably a better for a demo to say, huh? But it's basically, I didn't want to have any passwords on the disk in the clear. So OS 10 keychain's great for that. And I didn't want any firmware passwords on the disk in the clear. In case your disk gets lost, right? Especially if I were a drive, that's not bad, or, fl or flash drive or anything. It's encrypted AES 128-bit encrypted database. They cannot get it. So um, and the other day, I was looking at the file. I'm like, why can't I read? Why is SQL complaining it's encrypted right? Moron. Yeah, it was a long day. So, which is good. It's doing its job. OK. So I'll show you how this works. Yes, you're going to see the admin password for this machine. I don't care. It's a demo. That's why it's, it's, it's open in the clear. All right, so how does this work? Uh, all right. It's already populated, so. Sorry, thank you. Thanks for not throwing anything. OK, now's it up. All right, cool. Did you guys see the icon? Yeah, tractor beam, Star Trek, anyone? I did not make the icon. Cool artist we have here at Penn State did it for me. David Stong, he's really good. 
He made the other new one too, which I thought was pretty neat. All right, so this is not a sexy uh, application. It's not meant to be. It's meant to be an encrypted database editor. Databases are critical. Not really sexy, but that's okay. So BIC, as it says in the comments here, I could change it if I wanted to. Admin password, BIC added, and there it is. 20 Mac admins, 12. Big surprise on the password, huh? So now what BIC is going to do is, um, I'm going to undo that. Anytime I run, it's going to refer to this when I change the password on it. So, for example, let's do, let's just, well, I'm asking for a punishment, aren't I? Let's do it, sure. All right, first thing is, so the keychain, this is documented, I promise. This is for the demo to get the concept going. Penn State, I need to delete this because now you'll see if I show a password. Ah, sorry. And this database feature of storing all passwords in a crypto database, Deploy Studio does not do. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I had to throw something at Deploy Studio. It's a great app. It really is. They've done a good job, whoever they may be. All right, so there's the password there as well. Okay, so I'm going to delete that on purpose. It used to be system engineers there, it's rumored. It may still be. I've heard from two folks that Apple has people actively developing because they use it in house. I've heard that too, off and on. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 oh boy. That was my own fault. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh, that's right. This new news article recently about not being encrypted. <laughs> I get it now. Okay, old password. I just typed in 20 Mac. Ad oh, I better type slower. 20 Mac admins 12. I'm new password. Justin. J U S T I N. I don't think I typed it right. Okay, password is Justin. All right, so it's pretty <laughs> obvious, right? We're just gonna say what it is. Okay. All right. So now I'm gonna launch Bic. And we already saw the firmware password to the old one. So I should mention, this machine's firmware has already been set. So what Vic is going to use when I try to change the firmware password, it's going to say, whoa, I need to change this. I don't have the old password. Wait, I'm going to look in the database. There it is. And then it'll add the new password as well. That makes sense? So if it didn't, OK. So now the keychain is gone. So this also uses that. So we'll quit out of that. And and let Blastwrench config do it. They can both do it. They use the same code base. And I'll type in J-A-U-S-T-I-N. Remembers the password. And now, if I go to the firmware password, it reads that. And now it says, hey, this encrypted database is the password that is in the keychain. I can't, it's not the key to unlock the firmware database password. How do I do this? So I type in Justin, and it doesn't work. Oh, I need the old password if I would read my own message to myself. So now I'm updating it with the old password. I type in update, boom, it's now updated the password to be Justin. It re-encrypts the database, and now we can view it. Justin's not in there yet because I haven't set the firmware password yet. Does this make sense so far, what I'm doing? Okay, so the, bat, so the database was encrypted with 20 P Mac admins 12. I changed my admin password. Vic uses that to try and decrypt it. It can't. Now it says, hey, it's different. I should change this so it updates that. So I'll quit out, and now I'm going to run BIC. Oh, if I would click the right icon. And I'm going to go to default preferences. I'm only going to change the firmware. I won't bore you with the full restore process, I promise. And now I'm going to say apply. Now it has updated the firmware password, and it added Justin to the firmware database password file. OK? Because it needs to keep track of that. So now that's technically an old, an old firmware password. Opening up big firmware password, boom, there it is. Now it appears as Justin, the second, the second entry. Yay. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah, I realized this. I was working on big three point. I was busting my butt. I worked all over Christmas break. It was fun, actually. It was fun. I didn't get yelled at too much. And all of a sudden I realized, so rich prop tool. Uh-oh. I gotta do this quickly. How am I gonna do this? So that was so that was it was actually a lot of fun. Sometimes I work better under pressure. So that's how it manages firmware passwords, and I, I, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I think it works well. And the file, I should say, is actually the database is stored in the same uh, folder. Where is it? Oh, right there. So there's .bic db, bic database password. So 
Um, I'll have more documentation on that soon, but I think that I think that's a better way to manage it. So if the disk if this disk gets stolen, keychain's locked. That's locked. I don't care. Auto run. Auto run benefits. They're pretty they're pretty obvious. Enables BIC to launch and not uh, not prompt for admin password at launch time. Typing stuff. We don't want to do that, right? It's good to be lazy, and we are scripting stuff to not be, uh, so that we can be lazy. Enables BIC to decrypt a former password database file, which we just talked about, and greatly speeds up the restore process of having not having to click next, 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 next. Okay. And auto run requirements. We talked about this. Stores the admin password uh, in the in the keychain, so they can read it. Decrypt the firmware password database file and auto run with sudo writes. There's a key in the uh, your the workflow that you select. If it's selected and it's set auto run equals yes to the workflow, auto run runs. You can also there's a lot of checks in there. That say default run button. You can also say um, pause on restore. Multiple sanity checks built in. If multiple disks are found, actually this happened one time in our labs. This is why a feature got added. There was a scratch disk on a technology podium. And somebody built it. They forgot to unplug the FireWire drive, and there was a ton of theater video on it. Wiped. And I'm like, oh, God. So it got erased. We had to do an unerase on it. It worked OK, but it was. So BIC now has multiple sanity checks in to say, if multiple disks are found, you can add this yourself. You can say, I don't care. Just go. Or you can say, and now there's a flag to say dot blasters config ignore this. So I've added a lot of safety checks over the years by experience that we've had with our labs. And using it on my own workstation too, so I don't blow away my source code. <laughs> Only happened once. That's all it takes, really, right? And you're like, okay, that's motivation. All right, deployment methods. People ask about this all the time. We've talked about this. Uh, Firewire disks, USB flash drive, netboot master image. And you can edit your, your edit the workflows that work best for you. Uh, Talked about this, restore from local disks on the FireWire disk. I've got a big, well, not, it's not big, it's for demonstra demonstration, four gigs. Over AFP, SMB, HTTP or ASR multicast server, and auto mount server demo. So I'm going to reboot this Mac here. This is the client machine, I hope, it appears. I'm going to reboot it. It's netboot. Oh, wait, I probably don't need to for the demo. We're running out of time, too. I want to get to Q&A. We're close. I'll, to save time, I'll run it off the FireWire disk. That boot's going to be the same. It'll, it'll actually be pretty quick, too, but I'll just do the FireWire drive. All right, now it's coming up with the password. What was it? Justin. Yay, it works. <laughs> and I'm going to boot from the FireWire drive again, so bear with me when that boots up. Once it boots up, I'll show you the auto run. Oh, wait. I see what I wanted to do. I wanted to do an auto mount server demo to mount a server, which this won't do. All right. I'll do that. You guys want to see that? The auto mounting of a server, which is kind of a good demonstration of auto run and mounting. You're saying yes? Okay. All right. We'll do it. Uh, in order to do that, all right. I'll tell you what, since we've got. I want to give you guys time. We've got about 10 minutes for q and I need to leave some of that. While I'm getting this ready, we'll take some Q&A because I've got to do a few things here to set that up. It's just take me a minute, so I'll open the floor for questions. I know that was a lot of information. Ron, yeah? Um, it's probably in your documentation on uh, master disk image creation, but any sure. uh, best practices, uh, warnings, you know, uh, about things that you should Use it to DMG if you can. It's a clean image installation, and it takes you less time to do the clean up all the cruft. Um, using compressed disk images and scanning them is critical for fastest restores. Except ASR multicast, you cannot use compressed Im disk images. Those should be uncompressed, read only. Compressed in images are implied of read only, compressed. It's Apple, Apple trying to keep dialogues nice and short and small. So. Um, <coughs> Use blast image config, definitely. I think it's a good choice. Um, if you're covering up a firewall, yes. is the compression still going to save you time? It will, because it's less data to read from the disk. Really? Yeah, I know. I, I thought the same thing, too. I thought, well, is it really going to be fast because it's going to take time to decompress? I did test. It's way faster. Yeah, I, I know. I thought, 
Now, if you have an SSD, hey, you know, <laughs> awesome. We have a Mac Mini with an SSD. Boots, shut down, reboot, 15 seconds. I'm like, what's that? You don't have a firewall SSD. Not yet. I want one. Who doesn't? Who doesn't, right? It, yeah. I, I, we had a, I only got to use it for about a week before another hard disk crash, so I had to sacrifice it to that, but it definitely felt zippy. <laughs> All right, sorry, folks. <laughs> That's why I put the hint in. That was on screen, too. Oh. I did it on purpose. Sure, right. I'm like, why isn't this working? Oh, because you changed the password, moron. All right, let's try this again. I need to run BIC really quick to disable the firmware, so that's what I'm doing here, so I can net boot. Oh, I could have just held the option key in a while. All right. So I'm just say, gonna say default preferences next. I'm gonna say off. And if I can hit the apply button. Okay, now it's turned it off. And they needed the old password to do that. And I'm gonna reboot. I don't know if I need to show that. There's a video there. Oh. I'll tell you what, I will do some keynote slides with Get this ready for NetBoot, and we'll talk about that. Throw those up? OK. OK, so yeah, it works great with NetBoot. Somebody asked me years ago, does it work with NetBoot? Yep, sure does. NetBoot is, again, a full OS X installation Finder desktop um, environment. So it's a full version of OS X, and you just simply add BIC to the login items. You, have, you can have the NetBoot image log in or not, depending on what you want to do. For your security levels, paranoia, whatever you want to call it, I'm pretty paranoid. Um, I like to be secure if possible and have passwords. And we talked about encrypt, uh, using compressed disk images. And, um, and, you read the, and yeah, please read the extensive do online documentation. I promise they'll ha they will help. I'm glad to help out uh, clarify anything. If any documentation is not clear or missing, please let me know because I want to add it there too. Um, support. Uh, get it here, and then there's an email list you can subscribe to. Uh, I'm on there, I'm pretty active, uh, and there's been some good discussions. Gotten and others have chimed in with really good questions. Um, and calling out saying, hey, something's broken or not broken. Sometimes it's Bix's fault, sometimes it's just, uh, it's the, just under, or it's the OS sometimes too, so. And Bix is just a basic front end for a lot of command line utilities that Deploy Studio is using as well. So, and, yep, Apple system, Imaging and deployment, the PDF is still very applicable and useful. It talks about disk images, what they are, how to use them, how to scan, and why they're important for block resource. Sorry, Paul. Um, so I highly recommend reading that. These slides will be available, I promise. We'll tweet, I'll tweet the URL here soon, too, from the Mac and Men's conference hashtag. And future development. I'm working on the GUI app for editing the workflows. I think it's pretty easy, but people like GUIs and I like to program them, so I'll make one. And supporting Mountain Lion is my next major thing to do. Yes, I have the developer releases. I can't talk about it. I'd love to, but I can't. And new, yeah, new features are based on what we need at Penn State and what you guys want and people are using. So I've had a lot of good feedback from uh, people in the field using it, system mints and otherwise. And uh, yeah. Please join the discussion list. I really like hearing feedback of uh, just directions of where people would like to go. Oops, sorry. So, do you guys want to see the auto run? Yes. Okay, sure. Thank you. And I'll change the resolution here in a minute. It's going to be too high, I think, it's not, and not mirrored. All right, bear with me one second. It was funny when I was writing BIC 3.0. I'm thinking, I'm going to need to present on this. I probably should make it screen so it'll fit nice and, uh, nicely on an 8 by 600. So it barely fits. But it does fit. I'll change it to 8 by 6. All right, mirroring on. While you're waiting for me, feel free to fill out this, the uh, feedback if you want. And there's a box for it on the way out. And then. All right. Oh, boy. I have a lot of selections here. <laughs> I'm trying to remember which one it is. Uh, 
I think that's what I want. Okay. When you guys are ready, are you ready? Are we excited? System imaging is fun. Yeah? Ready? Here we go. All right, so I'm going to say next. That's the workflow I want. Boom, boom. It didn't see it, but it, it happened so fast. It said it, it set the firmware password to 20 PSU Mac and MINS 12. Here it's trying to mount the server. I hope it works because I've got them connected right now. Sometimes I've seen it slow on a local connection. On my home network, it mounts the AFP server like that. Um, I do have documentation on how it's auto mounting. The password for the server is again stored in the keychain, not in the script. You can mount scripts using the username and password, not secure. Don't do it. Use the documentation I have on my website, on our website, CLC, of how to do, of how to mount that. So I know why this isn't working. Wrong that boot server. And can it boot fast enough? That's the problem. I have two netboot images here. Did it get it? I think, uh, let's see. Okay, there it is. Whew. Okay, good. I was afraid I had too many. I have too many Lion servers installed on here. So now what's happened is that script mounted this share, AFP server Mac Macamins system disk images. It's an AFP share. That script mounted it. It said mount this server with user username, no password. That script then talks to the finder. The finder reads the keychain for that server, says, oh, log in with this, these credentials, boom, I'm in because you guys have seen the connect to server storing keychain and credentials, right? That's how that worked. Again, not the clear, which is good stuff. Okay, so now it's gonna run, and now the disk image. Path says slash volume system disk images fall 2012, same disk image, but now, instead of it being stored on the local machine, this has been net booted. The, 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 um, it's not booted from the FireWire disk or the internal drive, so it's a diskless net boot running BIC and restoring from an AFP share where the disk image is stored. And it's mad. Oh, I. Uh, well, safety features. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. I got to eject the FireWire drive. See? I ended up not killing my FireWire drive. That's a good thing, right? That was intentional, so that's, that's why it's nice to have that. It can be annoying at times, but I'd rather protect me than not. Okay, I'll get it to a point over there in a second, so. Easy to learn and use on the first run. You can download it and go. Uh, easy to extend and customize and streamline. I've tried to make it really, really fast, as fast as I can. And uh, I need sound effects. And so I'm ready for q and I'll get this to a point and I'll show you the rest. Jellion. Questions, what do you have for me? Jay Elliott, yes. Peanut butter and jelly. It's peanut butter jelly time? No, okay, I know it's weak. I know that was a lot of information. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Um, what do you do? I'm sure you've got some post, you know, post imaging things. You have to do the binding or other things. How do you handle those tasks? Some people do them at first boot, and um, there's a lot of good discussions. Good question. You can do that as a post install script uh, that would install a, a first boot. Um, but you, of course, want to make sure you're unbound before you make your master image. You've heard about that, right? Otherwise, the cache credentials and it gets all screwed up. So that's one thing I'd recommend. So you just add that as a post script as part of that. You would need to, well, this is booted from a different volume. Binding, I don't know much about AD. I mean, we have AD, I've used it before, so I think you really want to bind a machine when you're booted from the system that needs to bind to AD, not the booted drive. Is that correct for people who are using AD? Okay, so you'd want to have a pre-boot script that would bind to AD at that point? Is that what you guys would recommend? Anybody? If they're nodding in their heads, yes. So that would be how you probably had to do it, so. Uh, okay. Does it, does it matter what tool you create your image with? What tool you create your image with? Yes. Uh, I'd suggest Disk Utility. Apple's going to do the right thing. They know what files to ignore. They ignore the VM uh, swap file. That's a gigantic file. When you, well, they used to not. Now they do, I think. So they've got a list of exclude files because your image can get quite big. Like if you have 8 gigs of RAM, your VM swap sleep file is going to be 8 gigs. Mm -hmm. You don't want that in your image. It's, a lot, it's more time to copy it. It's kind of a waste. So, all right, we'll let that go. So, now, so you can see in the background, AFP volume is mounted. Come on. No, oh, it's so busy. Okay, fine. Whatever. Now it's unmounting it. These work. Okay, good. All right. Calcul oh, I don't know if you saw it there. It said calculating free space. That was another feature I added. This is a problem we ran into in the labs, and I added yet another hook in for it. In the labs, 
we had some older machines that had smaller hard drives. Our new lab image was just 10 gigs over that. No space, right? And so what would happen is ASR, I think it should do this. It does not, so I added it to BIC. ASR does not check to see before erasing the image, will your image fit? It just erases it and then says, oh, I'm gonna throw the disk image down. Oh, it's gone, it won't fit. Sorry, bye, your data's now gone. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's pretty annoying because in a lab environment, you, if the machine can't be built, I want it to stay running, right? If it stays at 10.6, that's fine. We'll call it another day, we'll get some hard drives or we'll retire that machine, right? So BIC now checks to say, it's been doing it for a long time actually. Will the image, I look at the calculation of the disk because I have a lot of code that did it, it was actually a lot of fun. Um, to s check the size of the disk image, will it fit on the disk? Yes, do it. Otherwise, bail out and say, not gonna fit, not gonna go. So I, had to, I added that feature. Sorry? Do you have a slush factor? A slush factor. Yeah, the image says it needs 40 meg. Oh. Uh, no, I'm doing it to the byte. I'm doing it to the byte. I could add, it'd be easy to add in, uh, yeah, I could add in, a, great feedback, thank you. I could add in an extra run workflow that says allow for 10 more gigs or something. So that'd be, that would be an easy thing to check. It's an easy addition, say, add so many more bytes. Depending on your definition of K, is it 1,000 or 1,024? Yeah. Gig, gig, uh, bit, gig a bit, yeah, all that. Okay, whatever. So, good. Yes? If I have... A bunch of uh, bunch of oddball Mac Minis with various mm -hmm. size hard drives in them. So mm -hmm. if it'll fit on, it'll, it doesn't care about the size of physical volume as long as the image itself will fit. Right? Correct. Correct. It will say, it'll say like, let's say you make an image from 100 and create an image from folder, not from device. Right. It takes longer, but it's defragged and a faster restore. And I've had images created from device won't fit on another volume because it thinks it wants the same to your, uh, the metrics, right? So if you create an image on a disk that's a terabyte and the data is only 40 gigs, the image will still end up being 40 gigs if it's from device, but then it won't restore on a machine that has a drive smaller than a terabyte. It's just like, what? Doesn't, it's kind of annoying. So if you create from folder, it says, oh, I'm making a completely new disk image. How much data is it? Now I'll make the disk image 40 gigs, throw the data on it, restores on anything that has at least a 40 gig hard drive and larger. BIC does. ASR doesn't, but, so, does that make sense? <coughs> okay. Okay, sorry I ran over. Hopefully that was good, uh, useful information. So, uh, feel free to fill out feedback and contact me if you have any questions. Thank you for coming. Nice job.